Well, uh, hey, thanks much for, uh, for joining us today for this uh, Distinguished Professor uh, Renewal Seminar um, in honor of, of Mike Bolge. And it's really a, a personal privilege and honor to introduce uh, Mike today. Uh, and many of you I, I know well and uh, have the chance to work with Mike since 1992 and, and a lot of, lot of projects, a lot of programs with him. And uh, again, it's just a personal thrill. I think uh, just as a reminder about the process, so uh, we've revised the way that we handle the, the five-year distinguished faculty reviews. That's something that the university requires. And uh, of course, there's a vetting process with credentials that we tried to streamline a bit. But the, the final step is, is asking our distinguished faculty to share some comments and thoughts with the, the broader faculty. And uh, you know, again, it's work for them. But I think it gives us the chance to tap into some of the thinking of, of our very best. So we really appreciate Mike doing that uh, today. I, I won't recap his uh, career again. Many of you know that. But uh, Iowa State undergraduate, and then he came to Purdue for his master's and PhD, and then kind of did a circle through the Great Plains, I guess, Mike, at Oklahoma State and Iowa State and Minnesota before joining our faculty in uh, 1992. And, and in those different places, Mike also held administrative appointments over time, I think Associate Dean, Iowa State Department Head at, at Minnesota, and uh, again, then joining us on the faculty here in the, in the early uh, 90s. Um, again, as a lot of you know, he works in the area of farm finance and strategic management. And uh, I think in his words, um, focusing on volatile and uncertain business climates, uh, we might know a little about that. I think oil is going to be free in two more days. So just, uh, just wait, they're gonna give it away soon. Um, but uh, that's our world in agriculture and, and that's Mike's focus. And you know, I was thinking about this, there's a lot of ways we can describe careers with numbers and, and accolades and, and those are there for, for Mike. I think uh, in, the, in the materials that were submitted on this renewal, I think he, they listed 36 uh, papers in the last five years and an H index of 27, which is quite high in the social sciences area. I started to count his journal papers, but the, his CV is 64 pages long, so I just gave up on that. But uh, more than 100 presentations a year, he's been named a fellow in the American Agricultural Association, the International Association of Food and Agribusiness Management. He's won the Hovde Award, and again, you can continue down that path. But I think another way to think about career um, and, and maybe uh, uh, impact is the whole issue of influence and, and relevance. And uh, you know, I, I get a chance to work a lot with industry, and I think it's very hard to find a manager who hasn't been a part of a program that Mike has done. I mean, he is, he's that well known uh, across our industry. And uh, I think Mike is a, is a master of ans asking the, the right questions and really challenging uh, conventional thinking and and I think that's not a that's not an easy thing to do with audiences and and he's equally talented at bringing people tools and concepts and frameworks and insights for helping them work through those challenging strategic issues and and the language he uses in his talks you hear it all the time when talking with managers because again they pick up on the kind of way he thinks about really complex problems and and for that mike we're incredibly grateful to have you on our faculty here at uh, purdue and today he's going to uh, to visit a very important and timely topic you see it up there the financial downturn back to the future please join me in welcoming dr mike bulgy thank you sir. well thank you jay thank you very much i appreciate that uh, very kind introduction and um I appreciate you all being here. It's really, really great to have the chance uh, to visit with some colleagues. I get out in the countryside quite a bit and uh, uh, don't necessarily get a chance to share some of the ideas we have uh, uh, with as many people here on the campus. And so that's really a pleasure to, to get a chance to do that and get your reaction to the, some of the things that we're doing. There's, there's three very simple reasons for the uh, the topic uh, that I wanted to, to spend some time visiting with you about. Number one, I just thought uh, this is kind of timely. Uh, we're in a, a pretty uh, uh, a difficult time for some producers, for the sector as general. Uh, and uh, so let's, let's, let's talk about something that's real and current and today. Number two, um, uh, I maybe in contrast to some have a little bit of perspective on this from previous times when we've been in economic downturns, that's one of the advantages. There aren't many advantages of age, but one is that sometimes you get a chance to see some of these issues more than once during your career, and we have had that opportunity. 
But the third thing that I wanted to do, and that's really the way I framed this uh, presentation, is to share with you some of the work that we have done here at Purdue University on this issue. And uh, the story of that work is the opportunity to collaborate with uh, some very, very productive people, students, colleagues, etc. And so I want to give the message uh, looking at uh, four or five pieces of work we've done over the last four or five years of how productive uh, we can be if we've got a cadre of people to collaborate with. Uh, and it's really not, uh, uh, I've been productive, uh, done a few things, but I think it's really, really the shop that we have the opportunity to work in, in both the Center for Food and Agricultural Business and the Center for Commercial Agriculture. So that's kind of the underlying kind of theme that I want to bring out as we talk about this. So let's just give a few dimensions of this economic downturn. I should share with you that I worry a little bit about this being a doom and gloom presentation. Um, uh, I think uh, I would prefer to consider it a reality check, okay? Uh, but there are some challenges, although we are now in some of our work doing a lot of analysis, which I'm not gonna have a chance to share with you, of the opportunity side associated with this downturn. And as in most industries, uh, when you have an economic downturn, you have opportunities. And those who are well positioned have the financial resiliency uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, adjust to the downside or to accommodate the downside actually will have significant opportunities for expanding their businesses, growing their businesses, moving into new ventures, et cetera. And that's one of the major themes that we now are moving into in work we're doing in terms of what is the opportunity side of this. But let's at least set the context in terms of two or three statistics and then we'll kind of uh, leverage some of the research that we've done. Um, probably the, the most biggest uh, uh, statistic or the most important statistic that people think of when they look at what's happened in the last couple of years in the agricultural sector is an approximately 53% decline in net farm income. And that's a very precipitous decline in income. We've had similar declines uh, in the past, but it's typically been over a longer period of time when income has gone. This has been one of the most rapid declines and deteriorations in income. In fact, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, and that's part of the adjustment, uh, the challenge in terms of adjusting to it. Adjusting to a declining income is one thing when it happens over a four, five, six year period of time. When you get half of your salary, just think of what if they, what if Jay came in and said, look, you know, the budget is just really hammered. We all have to take a salary cut and it's 50% over a two year period of time. I mean, that's just really, really tough. Oh, I'm sorry. You hadn't told them that yet, right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So this is pretty, uh, dramatic, obviously. Land values declining. We watch Iowa because Iowa seems to be the bellwether of what happens to land values. We haven't had as much of a decline in land values over the last couple of years in Indiana and in the Eastern Corn Belt. Western Corn Belt has declined more, about a 13% decline in land values in Iowa over the last two years. Probably the most significant asset value declines are not in the real estate although that's not insignificant because 85% of the balance sheet of the average farmer is real estate. So that's a really, really big part of wealth deterioration when you have these kinds of declines. But we've had somewhere, we don't have the same data sets to work with, somewhere around a 25% plus decline in machinery and equipment values in terms of used equipment. And one of, the, one of the things we're going to talk about is if the lenders have to or decide to, either for regulatory or for internal policy purposes, mark to market for farmers, i.e. adjust the value of those assets to market values, that is going to be a really, really, really difficult challenge for a subset, which we'll talk about of farmers, those being those farmers who have a large proportion of their land base rented, and most of their wealth is not in land, it's in machinery and equipment, and we'll talk about that, and we'll 
uh, uh, leverage that here in a second. In the agribusiness sector, we have had on the input supply side significant declining sales, particularly in capital expenditures. Um, the flash reports out of the machinery and equipment industry show combine and four-wheel drive tractor sales showing uh, declines of somewhere in excess of 40% per year. Machinery dealers are, uh, are flush with used equipment. They are really concerned about how to move this used equipment. Um, we're particularly concerned about that segment of the, of the industry because history has shown that in more difficult times, even for example the 1980s, which were even more of a precipitous decline in wealth and incomes than we at least have experienced so far and expect to experience in this downturn, that we lost somewhere around three to five percent of our farmers because of financial stress, selling out, bankruptcy, et cetera. We lost one out of four retail machinery dealers. 25% of our retail machinery industry was consolidated uh, uh, or people that went out of business. The common characteristic of those people in that industry was too, that had failed was too much used equipment. And we are back in that space again now. And uh, for those of us in the Center for Food and Agricultural Business who are worried about working with that segment of the market. We hear a lot of issues, a lot of concerns, uh, and uh, that is a big, big issue that we are very, very concerned about. Probably a little bit less impact in terms of financial consolidation with respect to the other input industries, fertilizer, seed, and chemicals, et cetera. Uh, in fact, some of them, as we all know from what's happening in this state with Bex, Bex is actually one of those companies that has actually seen this as a growth opportunity, and they are in fact growing very rapidly in, uh, in, in their geographic footprint, uh, which again is just an illustration of during tougher times, some organizations well positioned financially and otherwise can grow. We see a lot of restructuring, uh, which is again common during this kind of economic malaise to, or economic downturn time common in almost all industries, so we, the latest one is the DuPont Dow um, merger, uh, Monsanto, Syngenta, the Deere Climate uh, uh, Corp and Precision Planning, a lot of restructuring. We don't think <coughs> that it's over with yet. Um, we still would expect, as we said, I guess, Alan, back in November that Syngenta probably will uh, sometime be acquired by somebody. It's not clear now whether it's going to be the Chinese or Monsanto or somebody, but we would be surprised, for example, if Syngenta continues to exist as a company going forward. And there are others out there. We're just trying to use these as illustrations of the types of things that happen, okay? So agriculture is a cyclical industry, and uh, Jason Henderson will recognize this graph. This is something that uh, we put together. Jason, I guess, what, the publication date in this is 2012, right? Uh, so Brent Gloy and Jason, before he came here, when he was at the Kansas City Fed, and myself had a chance to put together a piece for our American Journal of Agricultural Economics, which we were pleased to have, I think it's fair to say, published because this was not something that was necessarily top of mind for our profession, where we tried to kind of look at the cyclical characteristics of, of this industry. And uh, if you... Uh, you can look at this, you'll see basically four cycles that we've been through in the last 100 years in terms of boom, booms in the agricultural industry. We're now in our fourth boom in this industry. Uh, the the, the uh, uh, downside of these four booms has been basically two busts, the bust of the 30s, the bust of the 80s. We had one moderation or soft landing out of the uh, boom that uh, associated with World War II. Uh, uh, into the 50s and 60s. And now the question that we were raising back then, and that's part of the title that we had, reversion to the mean, uh, are we in fact going back to something that's more normal from the period of time that we were experiencing 2012, 13, et cetera? Um, our expectation, just to give you a, uh, a heads up in terms of where we are going in a minute, is that we are going to be in a moderation, we are going to be in a soft landing 
We do not expect something like we saw in the 1980s or in the 1930s, uh, but that doesn't mean that for certain segments of the uh, uh, agricultural industries, machinery dealers we've already talked about, different characteristics. We'll talk about some farms, farming operations that will be more vulnerable than others in this period of time as well. So we are headed into that kind of business climate as we see it, not one that is going to have, in our judgment, a quick turnaround. If you look at this graph, back up a second, you'll see that typically the peaks don't last very long, the troughs are longer, uh, and that's a characteristic of this industry characterized or, 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 or precipitated by the fact that agriculture being a high fixed cost industry, generally production agriculture, doesn't adjust its supply rapidly at all like other industries do. Uh, when we build a bigger factory by bringing more land into production in this industry, when, prices when we have good prices, when prices decline, we typically don't take that factory and mothball it, shut it down like other industries do. We continue to operate that property because uh, we lose less money as a farmer when 40 to 40 or plus percent of our costs are fixed. Uh, we lose less money than we would otherwise by continuing to operate that property uh, even though uh, we won't be making money, we at least minimize our losses. And the only time we shut it down is when we actually get to the point where we can't pay a fertilizer, seed, chemical, and other variable costs. That's an economic concept which helps them understand why this industry is so, uh, is, is so lethargic to adjust supplies when we uh, see these downturns. And it shows up in these cyclical charts that we've indicated. So let's talk about projecting forward future financial uh, uh, vulnerabilities. This is some work that uh, Shasha Lee, uh, a graduate student here, a uh, Chinese graduate student who's now working for uh, one of the largest in New York City for one of the li largest banks, uh, uh, Bank of China. Uh, it was a really interesting study. It was a, f a firm level of uh, stochastic financial simulation model. We tried to look at different sizes a different uh, percent land owned and different debt to asset ratio farming operations. We populated this model with information from farm record data from the University of Illinois so that we could actually do something, uh, corn soybean farms, so we could actually do something that we could actually connect with specific kinds and types of farming operations. Uh, we built into this simulation model, uh, it's a stress testing kind of concept, we built into it distributions with, uh, in terms of crop prices, yields, fertilizer prices, cash, rents, and farmland values, three-year projections. The distributional information was obtained over about a 35 to 40-year uh, historical period of time, okay? So it's the classic kind of stress testing kind of analysis that is done in many cases, uh, uh, slight variations of this done by commercial banks, et cetera, to try to figure out, figure out how vulnerable businesses are to uh, the downside and see what kind of distributions we get in terms of some of the financial parameters and, and that they use for their underwriting standards. So let's look at the results from this work and get, see if we can get some insight into the kinds of farming operations that are the most financially vulnerable in this uh, period of time. Now, I apologize for so all the numbers we have here, but let's first look at uh, different sizes of farms. And uh, I'm going to want you to pay attention particularly to these uh, four numbers. You can see the net farm income. Interesting, but maybe not as all as interesting and informative as we see here in terms of, of some of the financial metrics that are really important to look at the financial vulnerabilities. And these are the kinds of things that lenders worry about in terms of what they would call underwriting standards. And you see for each of these metrics, the working capital metric, which is the basic liquidity of the business, the risk-bearing metric, which is the debt to asset ratio, and the term debt coverage ratio, which is basically your ability to make your payments on your land, machine, and equipment loans. Those are pretty basic metrics used in the lending community to try to think about whether a particular farm has vulnerability to financial stress. We have here, we used what's commonly used in this kind of analysis. It's, a, it's a, an at-risk modeling uh, technique. 
Uh, so we've got the mean values for all the runs we did. These are our three-year projections. And so this is the annual uh, the, uh, average for all three of those years. And then we have the probability that we will be, in this case, under a 35% working capital to, to value of farm production or roughly gross revenue for grain farms, uh, less than 35%. In other words, that there's less than a 35% of having a financial cushion in your operation. Uh, on working capital. Uh, here we've got the percent exceeding 55. In other words, you're more highly leveraged than the lender feels comfortable with in terms of the risk bearing ability of this business. And then we have also the term debt coverage ratio and we're trying to find out the probability of the chances of not having at least a 10% cushion or having enough income to service the principal and interest payments with a 10% cushion on that. Those are pretty standard kind of metrics that are used for underwriting purposes for lenders. And then we've got this last one we added here in terms of what's the chances of having a positive cash flow. And I guess the biggest takeaway you see here that is, is really important, these are uh, prop, this is farms that have 50% of the land owned, okay, 50% rented, and not a particularly high leverage position, 25% debt to asset ratio. You can see that the smaller farming operations uh, have about a 57% chance of not meeting the working capital uh, 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 underwriting standards, but they uh, will be not subject to bankruptcy or financial failure. They have a fair amount of risk bearing ability even in that particular situation. Uh, they have about a 73% chance of not being able to make the payments on their debt as scheduled, which means that they are going to have to think about how to refinance or make adjustments there, uh, and uh, about a 24% uh, probability of having a positive cash flow. Building into all these analysis were family living expenditures. I should emphasize that the small operations we did not assume that there was family live, there was a uh, not farm job uh, available. Uh, uh, so this is more reflective of the younger beginning farmer who maybe doesn't have uh, a, 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 an opportunity to uh, uh, work off the farm or nor does it have a spouse working on the farm. As we move up to the larger scale operations, we see that we don't see serious challenges with respect to any of these standard metrics in terms of the probability of not having the, uh, not meeting them. Uh, and so as we go up to the 2,500 acre farming operation with these kind of financial characteristics, uh, we're really, really in quite strong financial shape, right? And the second thing that's really kind of an important takeaway is that you see the chances of not having the risk bearing ability, even for those farms that are the most vulnerable, uh, is zero. In other words, uh, again, not high frequency of having to have uh, 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 sell this person out, have bank There's, There is ability in this business to handle the financial stress if they have an accommodating lender, et cetera, okay? Now, I, I talk about that because a lot of people think about financial vulnerability and the popular press talks about this in terms of this debt to asset ratio. And the debt to asset ratio in the agriculture industry is very low compared to other industries, about a 10%. So farmers have about 90% of equity in their farming operations, only 10% debt, right? And uh, that looks to be pretty attractive in terms of uh, risk bearing ability. It's about, it was about 22, 23% in the 1980s, so less than half percent, half of the vulnerability or the financial uh, uh, debt exposure that we had in the 1980s. And so a lot of people say, well, if you look at the debt to asset ratio in the industry, including the Secretary of Agriculture, we don't have a problem in agriculture, right? Well, um, that's not the only metric. And in fact, probably it's not the most important metric to be able to look at if we have a potential impending financial problem. Let's look at this now with respect to some additional types of characteristics. And here is that smaller scale farm uh, with a 25% debt to asset ratio with different percentages 
of the land owned. So here we have 85% owned, 50% owned, owned, and 15% owned, i.e. these people are renting at average cash rents a lot of land with distributions on those cash rents. We've got a lot of other things to talk about, but I just want you to kind of look at what this operation looks like in terms of some of these standard metrics. If you look at the debt to asset ratio, no problem. No problem. These people are not financially vulnerable if that was your sole and singular metric. On the other hand, if you look at something that lenders are very concerned about, in this particular environment, and that is, will we have the financial liquidity to be able to handle the vulnerability on the downside? There's a 99% probability that we will not have a cushion there. Okay, we have no cushion if that is a 35% uh, debt to asset ratio. And our numbers show that we are burning through our working capital relatively rapidly. If we look at the term debt coverage ratio, there's a 99% probability that we won't have any, that we will violate that underwriting standard as well for those farms that have most of their land rented, okay? So this should at least give you some indication based on our work, uh, and we'll go to one more slide in this, of who we think is the most vulnerable in the situation. Not surprising, the most vulnerable people in this situation are those people that are in the rental market who have been aggressive in renting land, and we're not talking about here larger farms, we're talking here, in many cases in this situation, farms that are probably, that are only modest size, many cases being uh, characterized demographically as beginning farmers or early career farmers, who have been aggressive in the rental, didn't have a family member to help assist them to any significant degree start their business, and they will have challenges with respect to not their debt servicing, pardon me, not their uh, risk-bearing ability, it's going to be primarily in terms of running out of cash, in terms of making the loan payments and having a financial cushion. Now, if you've got that kind of situation, the typical approach of a lender to this would be, well, we don't have too much debt, we ought to refi this customer and try to refinance this customer and see if we can figure out how to stay with him. What we did not build into this model was a distribution on machinery values. And what I say earlier has happened to machinery values, down 25 to 30%. And on top of that, and so these farms right here, in this category, most of this equity that they have in their business is in the machinery, not in land, right? And lenders, even under good times, don't like to refinance on land equity, okay? They really, really are very hesitant to refinance on land, or on, on machinery equity. They're very, very hesitant to refinance on machinery. And so we have these people that really don't have a particularly good safety valve because their equity is down, they can't make their payments, they're running out of cash, and they don't have the refinancing capacity that others would have, okay? Just one other quick chart. Here is uh, uh, the larger scale farming operations now. We wanted to look at the question of the larger operations if they have more, lever or, uh, 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 more leverage. So we still have 50% of the land owned, 50% rented. We have that rental risk that we have to worry about because land rents don't adjust down They're very rapidly. There's a distribution here, but it doesn't go down very rapidly in terms of the land rents in the market. There's the first set of numbers that we looked at on that first slide. We doubled that debt to asset ratio, more leverage in this operation. And again, you see some deterioration in their financial position. Their working capital now, there's about a 50% chance that they won't meet their underwriting standard. Still no problem with respect to their risk bearing ability. They are encountering some the repayment problems now compared to where we were before. But the advantage these people have is that in fact they have a significant land base that they can refi on, okay? They haven't got all of their equity in machinery and equipment which is declining in value. And so these people will have a fair amount of, of capacity to visit with their lender and re refinance and move through this period of time 
without having to sell assets, et cetera. So the bottom line in terms of this analysis is fairly clear that those farmers who have been uh, have a high proportion of their land rented uh, will probably have the most financial vulnerability. And we started in this analysis with average cash rents. So those that have been even more aggressive than the average in terms of bidding up rentals will be even more vulnerable. And that's going to be almost irrespective of size of business. Larger scale farming operations with 15 to 20 percent of their land owned, the rest of it rented, and they've been aggressive growing with cash rents with most of their equity showing up in their machinery line, will encounter pretty significant financial stress and they really don't have much of a safety valve to back up on when it comes to working with their lender. We don't know how many farmers that is, will be. We don't have good information from uh, census or other sources to give us a feel for this, but we do have a subset of agriculture that will be financially vulnerable because of this downturn. Even though it's going to be moderate compared to history, we still have a subset that is going to be vulnerable. So what about these land values? It's just the, the third thing we want to kind of a piece of work that we want to talk about, again, leveraging work that colleagues, we've done ha, had the opportunity to work with colleagues here. Here's some work that, again, uh, Tim Baker and Michael Langmire and I had a chance to do. And, uh, uh, and the, here we were trying to look at this question of uh, uh, is land, uh, the basic question we were trying to answer is land uh, overpriced. In fact, I think one of the articles we said is now a good time to farm, buy farmland, et cetera. We're trying to look at what's happening. Land values have just skyrocketed, as most of you know, and uh, we wanted to kind of find out whether, in fact, we are uh, paying a premium for this land uh, in today's market. Let me give a context for what we're talking about here. There's a lot of different financial metrics you can use to measure the value of an asset or whether it's overpriced, et cetera. The, the one we decided to use here is a standard one used in the financial market. It's basically uh, the P-E ratio. So you take the price of a stock, you ratio it to the earnings of that stock, and that is an indication of what people are willing to pay for a dollar of earnings from that stock. We use the same concept to think about farmland, the value of farmland and the earnings from that farmland. Generally, P-E ratios in the financial markets run in the 15 to 20 area, right? So people are willing to pay from 15 to $20, depending upon the stock and other characteristics, for every dollar of earnings. Uh, probably the, the person that has taken this, uh, this metric to its, uh, to its most credible level is a guy by the name of uh, Schiller, 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 who uh, won the Nobel Prize on valuation in real estate markets, et cetera. Uh, he has, uh, runs this index on a regular basis and has used it pretty successfully to kind of predict when we are in, uh, or suggest when we are in financially vulnerable times in terms of uh, the financial markets and the housing market. And we wanted to look at it in terms of farmland. So we basically did that kind of analysis uh, and uh, we, uh, re we did it actually over a 100-year period of time, uh, uh, and we're going to only report the, the information from 1960 to 2015 for West Central Indiana, okay? So here's the numbers for those, that ratio for uh, that period of time. And if you look at those numbers, the average over this period of time of this P-E ratio was uh, in the high teens. Um, we, uh, we have, uh, uh, in fact, if you look at the longer period of time, this, uh, this ratio typically runs very similar uh, to the ratio uh, in the financial markets. So it's a fairly strong correlation or relationship between the P-E ratio in the land market, farmland market, and the P-E ratio in the stock and other financial markets, okay? The interesting thing to us was comparing what happened in the previous boom uh, to what's happened in this boom in terms of this P-E ratio. So you can see in the boom of the 1970s that we came up, came out on the top there uh, with a P-E ratio of about 21. 
Uh, it did decline to 11. And now we're at a PE ratio, or we peaked out with a PE ratio of 33 in this particular boom. And uh, one looks at that number, and one has to be more than nervous, I would argue, that when you have that, I should emphasize this is average cash rents being used to uh, proxy earnings, average land values to approximate or to proxy the price, not, and the averages are less than 9,000 on farmland values. So we're not talking about the 10, 11, 12, 15, or the record number in Iowa, which I think was uh, 20, 219 in Northwest Iowa. We're not talking about those kinds of numbers. We're talking about average numbers, right? In fact, if you do look at some of the PE ratios that uh, have been done for these higher priced lands, we're talking about PE ratios that are closer to 50 rather than 30, okay? This would at least make one cautious, I would argue, about whether we have overpriced land in this market, even more than we had overpriced land during this period of time. And the issue that one always worries about is that if you do that, what is the prospects that that is going to be what happens? A precipitous decline, about a 50% decline in land values during that period of time uh, for at least the Western Corn Belt states. Will we mimic that in this period of time uh, uh, or not? We have some perspectives on that we'd be happy to share with you. We don't uh, have any empirical evidence of whether that's going to happen. Our expectation, just to, and we'd be happy to explain why uh, if you want to in Q&A, our expectation, we're already seeing an adjustment in land values. Uh, we uh, have been saying publicly that we see somewhere between a 15 and a 20% decline in Indiana land values through the adjustment process, and we've been talking about this adjustment process being a three to five year adjustment process. Nothing like we saw in the 1980s. So to answer the question that we were looking at is, okay, is now a good time? Oh, by the way, there's what's happened to the uh, uh, P rent and, and the 500P. They mimic each other to some degree. You can see that there's more volatility in terms of the S&P type of thing than there is in the farmland market. But this is where we were trying to go. Uh, we wanted to find out, okay, if you pay too high a price, this ain't rocket science, pardon my English, if you pay too high a price, what's the, uh, for an asset, uh, if you use the PE ratio as a metric of that, what's the chances that you're gonna have a profitable or make a, have a reasonable rate of return? And if you basically calculate the, uh, the 10 year rate of return, i.e. buying an asset, holding it for 10 years, what you find is the classic relationship you would expect. You see that as you get a higher PE ratio, the rate of return that you're gonna get on that asset goes down. And if you look at this uh, rate of return, uh, PE ratios in the 25 to 30 uh, percent, pardon me, 25 to 30 area, we find that the rate of return generally for those assets generates, if you look at the history of agriculture, from 60 to 2005 uh, that we basically had a rate of return in this industry for, if we had those, we would have a rate of return in the, in, on, uh, of about, uh, uh, about zero on that investment, okay? Uh, if in fact you were to buy at something closer to the 15 uh, PE ratio, 16 PE ratio, you see that we've got rates of return uh, here closer to uh, uh, 10 to 12 percent, which is very competitive with what it is in other, in other industries, okay? So that makes one concerned about what kind of, whether in fact we have bid land values above a reasonable rate of return. So we said, well, but land maybe is an asset that you're going to hold longer, and so if you hold it for a longer period of time, if you have a buy and hold strategy and hold it for 20 years, what happens? So here's our 20-year set of numbers, and you get an interesting uh, uh, implication out of these numbers. Notice that uh, certainly you still have a lower rate of return on that investment if, in fact, you pay a PE ratio in the 20 to 30 area 
compared to if you pay a P ratio uh, for that land in terms of uh, something in the 10 to 15. But notice here that um, you still are at an 8% rate of return on that farmland. Okay? Uh, so, so what's the story here? The story here, here is that, in fact, uh, it's probably, in fact, that was our conclusion, it's overpriced, it's probably going to adjust down, but it's not like uh, 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 many other assets where you probably can't recover. You just have to hold it for a long period of time. You have to take a buy and hold strategy on farmland to capture uh, the recovery side of this. Okay? And so in some way, remember, we're talking about paying 9,000 plus or minus, not 15,000 plus or minus for this land. So this is actually part of maybe the good news story, is that you, know, you can overbid for farmland and still, if you are willing to hold it for a long enough period of time, still recover. Okay? In most other assets, you don't have the potential recovery that you do in this farmland. Farmland, uh, we, part of this study also was looking at what's the, uh, uh, what's the uh, long-term rate of return on farmland, what is the uh, inflation hedge potential of farmland. It's one of the best inflation hedges they are over a 100-year period of time. And we also looked at the question of what happens in terms of the, uh, uh, the correlation between the return on farmland and other assets. And the correlation uh, is about, is about 0.15. It's one of the best diversification assets in, in, the, in, in the financial markets. And so in that sense, that's why uh, it's attractive to uh, investment funds and other types of outside investors. It's really uh, a, a really attractive port, uh, investment to add to the portfolio as long as you take a buy and hold strategy. A buy and or, you know, hold strategy is really critical for this asset. Well, let me just finish by talking a little bit about some of the final stuff that uh, we've tried to do uh, in this space. And uh, uh, this is work that uh, uh, Michael Langmeyer and I have done on this safety net uh, for the safety net being in the form of the farm program, the, 24, the uh, 2014 farm program, and also crop insurance. What kind of protection does it provide on the downside for agriculture? The USDA's projection is that 20% of net farm income, this reduced net farm income for 2015 will actually come from uh, the farm programs, the, farm, the safety net farm program and crop insurance. That's uh, one of the highest percentages we've had in recent history. So it's really, really critical. Um, but here's the problem. Both of these programs now adjust to the market. So as we see lower and lower prices, the mechanics of the program adjust the amount of demnification under the crop insurance program to those lower prices and the protection in terms of farm program payments also declines as a function of, of those uh, adjusting to the markets. So our projections are uh, for a case farm here in Indiana uh, that uh, uh, farm program payments that are now somewhere between zero and $60 an acre, uh, a base acre, depending upon what county you're in in the state of Indiana, uh, for 20 of 15 payable in 2016 will probably disappear by 2017 28 completely okay because the market will basically adjust down the computation so that this is art county by the way which is what most farmers have signed up for that those program payments will disappear because of the mechanics of how the program adjusts unless we get a significant uh, improvement in uh, commodity prices to reset the computations, okay? So the payments are likely to disappear by 2017-18. Uh, but the other thing which is interesting is uh, the farm program payments are capped. Uh, and our work shows that uh, 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 two things. Number one is if prices go down further, you get no more program payments, no higher program payments which is in contrast to previous safety nets where what happened when prices continued to go down, you got bigger payments. 
That's not true with this farm program. I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying it's not true. And so we're capped out in terms of how big those payments are, have the potential to be. But the other side is if it, we're in a dead zone in terms of what could happen to them if prices improve. Okay? And our analysis show that actually for 2016, if margins improve uh, only by about 33 cents for every dollar increase in market returns. So if prices improve, what happens is that farm program payments go down during that period of time as prices improve. And so what you get is you only get a 33 cent net increase in cash position for every dollar increase that the market gives to you. Uh, you get a reduction in terms of your farm program payments as, as a result of the way the program is run. A lot of farmers are hoping for price improvements from where we are right now, right? What they don't fully appreciate is that that's not going to give them much additional income. It will give them some, but not much additional income. And the final thing is uh, crop insurance guarantees have already, or protection indemnifications, have already gone down by uh, uh, about 50% since uh, uh, 2012. We've already seen significant declines there, and if we continue to see uh, prices stay under pressure or even just stay where they are, we'll see some further deterioration in terms of the crop insurance production. As we'll say in a minute, this government safety net has a lot of holes in it, and we don't fully appreciate maybe at the farm gate level, probably at the lender level either, the vulnerability we have there as well, okay? Well, finally, here's the work that uh, we're doing in the Center for Commercial Agriculture, so Jim Minnert and uh, Michael Langmeyer and myself and others, uh, actually uh, people in the Center for Food and Agriculture Business, uh, Alan and, uh, and uh, Michael uh, and, and Mike Gunderson have been involved in this work as well, uh, trying to figure out how to respond to these kinds of financial stresses, what to tell uh, uh, farmers, producers, uh, how to help agribusinesses respond. And all I have here in the spirit of finishing this up is to kind of give you the laundry list that we talk about, working capital we've already talked about, focusing on cost, as, uh, as Alan Gray will tell you, cost on the right metric. We have had a real problem in our profession of doing all of the cost calculations on a per acre basis. And as we tell farmers, you don't sell acres, you, say bu you sell bushels. And if you really got to understand cost control, you've got to understand it, cost per unit of whatever you're going to sell per unit of output, not per unit of input acres. And uh, we need to do our cost per bushel and make sure that we reduce them. Rents and family expenses are two areas, some fertilizer, Seed and chemical reductions uh, are possible as well. Chemical uh, uh, fertilizer, particularly, appears to be uh, a down about at wholesale down about 10 percent this year. Extending repayment terms, refinancing, managing uh, price with forward uh, pricing and crop insurance types of, uh, pr uh, of uh, procedures. Using all those production skills, which we probably got a little bit lethargic in using when we had seven dollar corn and maybe weren't quite as focused on everything we needed to do to reduce our cost and increase our efficiency and productivity, time, uh, time uh, lines in terms of getting things done, careful use of inputs, buying right. Uh, the, the, the phrase we use in the countryside to help farmers understand this is the, the first and most important marketing decision you make is what you pay for your inputs, not what you sell your product for. You have more control over what you pay for your inputs, number one, and number two, it sets your cost structure. We have, as you would expect, received some pushback from the uh, uh, agribusiness companies on this statement because they keep suggesting that we're trying to convince uh, farmers to buy the cheapest stuff they can. That's absolutely not what we say. In fact, what we have is we have a spec sheet that we use. The spec sheets we use has 12 things on that spec sheet and price is only one of the 12 things that you think about when you're trying to buy uh, inputs. So it's a procurement mentality rather than a, 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 the typical let's buy and pay whatever price. 
offload excess assets, downsize, and maybe even in some cases add an off-farm job to the, uh, uh, to the family uh, income flow. So here's, uh, here's the, the, the bottom line, and be happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, we still are pretty optimistic about the long-term future of agriculture. We think we're in a bump in the road. We think we are in an environment, our research supports it, uh, uh, that we have a, a downturn. We don't think it is a bust. We think uh, we're in more of what Chris Hertz would call a, a moderate, moderating period, a moderation. Some people call it a reset, okay? So we need to recognize that we are in that environment and manage the businesses we're involved with accordingly, whether they be farming operations or agribusiness companies. Uh, we don't think it's going to be a bust, but the recovery is going to be sluggish. Uh, we have this short peak, long trough problem, which we hinted at earlier with the cyclical work. Uh, and the improvement uh, in the financial position is going to come primarily from cost reductions. We aren't anticipating that the market is going to provide. We could have a weather event. We could have something happen dramatically that would change that perspective. But we probably can't plan on it. Okay? As we've already indicated, not necessarily a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of financial failures of the typical type uh, in terms of people having to sell their farm. Cash shortfalls, working capital burn rate, repayment capacity, though, are going to be the sources of vulnerability. Most vulnerable, as we've indicated, are the renters um, with uh, uh, declining machinery values and, uh, and cash rents adjusting down slowly. And then finally, the public safety net has a lot of holes in it. And so as we go out further, particularly in terms of 17 and 18, uh, we are concerned that unless the market provides some adjustment on the cost side particularly, that we're going to have uh, a more extended period of vulnerability. So what kind of questions do you have? So, so I noticed Otto, I, I'm surprised actually, because Otto said that he was planning, and maybe he's planning to do it now. I thought he was yes. going to. Yes, right after I asked the question. Okay. He's, he said I was going to go and say, I don't believe a damn thing you say and was going to leave. <laughs> Otto, if you would hold that button down, because they're, they're recording this for the CCA, so if you don't mind, just, yeah, just hold it. Okay. Mike, why don't we see more in the way of particularly price declines in nitrogen fertilizer? Uh, the old numbers are that uh, the costs for nitrogen fertilizer are six, 40 to 60 percent the natural gas. Natural gas prices have gone from ten, eleven dollars down to even below two dollars. Um, is is this an oligopical situation, or, or what are we seeing? Yeah, I. So I don't. I think I think you are exactly right. I think we do have a market that has a fair amount of pricing power in it, and that pricing power has kept uh, us from adjusting down recognize that until recently a lot of the nitrogen in particular is produced offshore and they still have a lot of offshore companies that are not subjected to the same kinds of market discipline and or regulatory rules we have here in the U.S. That is changing because we have a lot of new plants under construction or at least announced to be under construction here in the U.S. which should change the market competition in these markets. It has, it is coming down at wholesale about 10, I, the latest numbers I've seen show it even down to about 15, about 15 percent. Whether that will be transferred through to the producer level is still unclear, but we see some adjustment down there. But I think there is a fair amount of pricing power in that industry. Great question. Jason. So what should we be looking at to identify when the turnaround starts. We've talked about the downturn and it's going yeah. to be in this moderation period. But at some point in time, you talk about the future going, there's going to be an, an uptick. What should we be looking at to see when that happens? Yeah, well, I, I, I think the issue in terms of, of having a turnaround is going to be when, in fact, we uh, have margins closer to 
zero in the grain operations rather than uh, right now about $100 an acre loss is the projections that uh, in fact Chris Hurt and, and Michael Langmeyer are, are revising those and they seem to don't go down closer to zero, they seem to be getting bigger. Michael's numbers he told me today in some cases are showing at $150 per acre loss, right? I think it is the turnaround occurs when that margin, that negative margin goes back down to zero, okay? That means that we don't have the same kind of cash flow and working capital burn rate we have with, uh, uh, it, it, with a lot of our farm customers. Our expectation is that that's still two, maybe three years out, okay? But it is narrowing, right? Um, and so that would be, it seems to be, when we see the kind of bottoming out that would you like you would like in the land market uh, uh, we're, we're we are in a period of a lot of no sales out there although a lot of the no sales after the auction the public auction the deal gets cut behind uh, closed doors sometimes not at the at the reserve price that the, was announced at the auction uh, that uh, my expectation is that market when we see it down 20 plus percent will be probably uh, uh, an indication that we've kind of are in the bottoming out phase and when we start seeing more transactions occur in that market. Uh, it is hard to predict uh, uh, predict troughs, right? Uh, but those would be things I would be watching. Yeah, I've got a question about um, the project that Lee did in conjunction with your findings about the cash rents. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider seeing what the impact would be if instead of having average cash rents, you indexed those rents to either corn prices or to the returns per acre? Yeah, uh, the great question. Um, so we didn't do that, okay? And part of the reason we did not do that is that we were trying to drive this out of historical data sets and institutional structures. But uh, one of the things that we maybe, your question really kind of creates a, a, another observation, I guess, that we are very, very, I would argue, uh, uh, very traditional in the way we do rental arrangements in the agricultural industry, very myopic about the way we've done it. We've moved our rentals primarily from crop share rents where we had a sharing of the risk between rental uh, landowner and operator. Now we've transitioned away from that into a lot of, of, of cash leases. We are trying to move back to sharing through flex cash leases, but that's a pretty difficult thing. We do need to think about more creative ways of figuring out how to set rental rates in the land market. And we could learn a lot from the rental markets in the commercial real estate business because they use a lot of different ways to figure out and it's interesting, in, even in other parts of agriculture, I looked at uh, some properties uh, uh, on a website in, in uh, uh, Arizona, and they have indexed rental rates, right? Reset, indexed rental rates, they index them as a function of cost and that type of thing, to your point. Those are just not procedures we use in the Midwest, and we really need to think more creatively about how we set prices on rental property other than our kind of classic setting it as a function of uh, uh, fixed cash arrangements. Because what we've really done, what we've really done is we've taken a lot of the risk bearing ability, uh, absorptive capacity off the market. Uh, the people that have the risk uh, absorptive capacity are those people that are owning the farmland. And we basically said, you don't have to take any of the risk. Mike, could you comment on what you are seeing or expecting with respect to consolidation, especially among uh, you know cash grain farmers in the in, uh, in the Corn Belt? Yeah, so uh, we're going to probably see uh, a, a continuing consolidation phase as we continue on uh, through this adjustment process. What you will see, we think, uh, at least this is what happens historically, is some of the really aggressive growing operations will probably not be able to maintain their uh, size. 
they will either have to be liquidated completely or at least reduce their uh, financial position or, and, and their, the size of their operation by giving up some rental property, et cetera. Okay? But uh, history typically shows that during that period of time, you typically don't refragment back to where you were before you started. That there are enough uh, mid-size or bigger than mid-size farming operations that have been fairly conservative in their expansion process that they now pick that property up. And so what happens is that you continue to consolidate the industry during this rather than uh, uh, refragment it back to the, the sizes we had before. It just, what we do is we change the players in the market, but we don't go back and kind of redistribute all that land back to the small scale producers. It's generally what not, it doesn't happen. So we'll see continued consolidation. We won't see as many larger farmers fail in our judgment as we saw back in the 1980s, but we will see those people and their properties being acquired by other uh, less aggressive but still fairly sizable operations that in the vernacular kept their, kept their powder dry for this opportunity and they will take advantage of it. We see the same thing happening in the machinery and equipment market. Those farmers who said, I'm not going to be as aggressive in terms of buying new every year uh, are, have had some phenomenal buys in the last year and will continue to have that buying uh, used equipment for, that has almost all the features, a full guarantee, a full warranty, uh, and, uh, uh, and they're going to consolidate uh, that side as well. Consolidation will occur in the input supply industry. We expect we'll go through another wave of that like we've indicated before. We'll see some machinery dealers fail and they will uh, be consolidated into uh, uh, other ownership patterns. I think we need to, to wrap it up uh, now, but we do have reception out in the hallway. So let's uh, give Mike another round of applause. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.